Our Father, we're thankful, God, for this day and the bountiful blessing, God, of giving us another day of life. And, Lord, an opportunity to gather once again in the house of God today. We pray, Father, you'll bless our time together. Lord, as we get in the Word of God, may we seek wisdom and guidance and help from your precious Holy Word. Thank you for these that have made the way out here today. Pray, Father, you'll bless them. Give them a good blessing. And, Father, give them safety. Fathers are out and about. And we want to thank you, God, for protection among our people. Lord, for keeping us safe from the virus. And, Lord, for keeping us safe from the evil and harm. And, Father, we just thank you for your guiding hand that guides us, Father, in the right way. And, Lord, we're just thankful, Father, day by day. Lord, we know you put people in our pathway for a reason. And so, Father, we just pray, God, you'll give us wisdom to see what's in front of us. And, Lord, to pray for those, that Father, that are uh, in harm's way today. And, Father, I pray for those that are sick. And just ask you, Lord, to be among our people. Lord, bless us today. Help us as we just read your word this morning and, and discuss a little bit about what the word of God has to say. May it feed us. May it help us. May it lead and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing, Are You Washed in the Blood? You should have the words. And are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Anybody in need of a prayer sheet? One here. Do we have the prayer sheets in here? Got one here. Anybody else? Two, three. Where are they? Okay. They're getting them. Anybody else? Yeah, I got one. All right. <laughs> you see, in the way of announcements here, um, of 
course, we're continuing this Arise virtual conference. We was due to be down there this week, but due to the way things are, we're here. But anyway, that continues tonight for the young folks, and they start at 5 with games, and then they have food, and then they're in here by 6.45 a.m. for that conference starts then. And it's been really good. And right here, Juan. It's been really good, good preaching, singing, and it's not as good as being there, but almost, almost, it's, it's really good, so we thank God for that. And then, of course, uh, Sunday school, we uh, keep in mind there this week, um, uh, we'll be having Friday night prayer time, no uh, Zoom meeting for you folks that are on the uh, uh, Brother Russ Zoom meetings, not having them this week, uh, we'll resume those probably in a couple of weeks, but anyway, um, of course, Friday evening, prayer time, uh, that's live stream through the Facebook page. And then, of course, Sunday, we've got our family Sunday school, uh, morning worship, evening worship. Now, uh, this uh, Sunday for our evening worship, uh, uh, we will be having a baptismal service and uh, as well as a quarterly business meeting. So it will be a busy evening here. So, but uh, it will be all right. Don't get, it don't get dark now until after 9 o'clock, does it? So, so anyway, I... Uh, come to church and uh, we got a young man that was saved here uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, he wanted to be baptized because he's getting ready to go to boot camp and he wanted to be baptized before he went. Amen? So we're going to take care of that Sunday night and uh, so praise the Lord for that. And I will give you this announcement. Uh, some of you probably have heard it by now. Uh, that on uh, uh, August the 1st, we'll be having a, what we call a church service, worship service outside. And that'll be out back here. We'll have a stage and uh, Jonathan Buckner and Chosen Road will be here. And uh, I'm going to preach a little bit. And, uh, and they're going to have some singing and some songs. We'll have a place for you to set chairs, a place to park cars. There's somebody coming uh, with a transfer some way to pick it up on the radio. And so that's on August the 1st, 7 o'clock. So keep that in mind. You're welcome to come if you so want to. So Now, let's see. In the hospital, continue to pray for these guys. I haven't, heard, I haven't had an update on Marvin Thompson. Has anybody? Oh, okay. Okay. You're, here, you're talking about here in town? Yeah. In Compass down here? Okay. Well, let's continue to pray for him. And then, of course, today at 2.30, I'll be uh, taking part in a graveside service for Judy, uh, Judy Cotton. So you all pray for that and pray for that family. Uh, Judy was, uh, when she was able to come, uh, she hasn't been able to come for a couple of years. She's, been, she's had pancreatic cancer, and uh, she was very faithful to come. And she sat right back over here. I remember, she, I remember she would come a lot of times with her oxygen and she came when she didn't feel like coming. But anyway, Judy went to heaven. Amen. Amen. And her service today at 2.30. So pray for that, uh, for that service after a while, if you will. Of course, pray for lost people. Pray for our land in which we live. Amen. Uh, we live in an evil day and uh, evilness abounds everywhere. But God is still God, isn't he? Yes. And God is still in control. Mm -hmm. And so we praise God for that. And uh, uh, we, we need to be giving God the glory. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, for all that he is doing. And for his watch care and for his help. Well, we got so many people today. Uh, I heard a statistic uh, a few days ago about, I think, something like, 40, almost 50% of the people have no belief in God. That's almost half of the people now in our world today. Uh, isn't that something? And we wonder why evilness abounds. And, uh, and then I wonder what percentage of the other percent that says they do believe God is actually praying. And actually seeking God. And how many of them is faithful to the things of God? That'll probably narrate even half again, if not more. 
And so it's not time to have less people. We need more people. Amen. Praying and praising God and, and letting the world see that we still praise God. Amen. And so um, we need to pray for that. We need to pray for our nation, our leadership, our president, governors, those that are in leadership position. They do need our prayers. We're, we're commanded, by the way, in Scripture to pray for them. It didn't ask them, the Bible didn't ask us whether we liked them or not. It did. It told us to pray for them. We may not agree with them. And uh, most time, if you stay long enough, you'll find something you don't agree with. And that's been it. it's in any type of leadership. <laughs> Amen. But, uh, but prayer, you can pray for everybody. And we do have that privilege to do so. So pray for them. Pray for our nation. Pray for um, the health needs here. Uh, many folks on our prayer list today. Uh, we don't know the case of every one of them, but God knows them all. Uh, surgery's pending. I know that Shelby, I've not heard whether she got set on a date for her surgery or not. She's been having some other health issues. So let's pray for her. And uh, uh, you see on the back here, Pastor Larry Dare, I think, is facing surgery sometime soon. And uh, pray for your church. Keep praying. And uh, pray for these missionaries. Pray for these meetings tonight, tomorrow night, for these young people. Having a good time. I found out I wasn't young anymore. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Anybody else with prayer requests? I just have a praise. Thank you for praying for the prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, praise the Lord for that. Amen. Thank God yes. for answer prayer. Anybody else? I want to thank you all for praying for my daughter-in-law. The surgery went very well. Oh, good. And my husband got a good report when he has lymphoma and said he got a really good report last week. Amen. I'm just grateful for you, praying. Praise the Lord. Thank God for answer prayer. Mm-hmm. Debbie. Okay, let's pray for Chad. He's facing back surgery, right? So let's remember him. Okay, we have a special unspoken request here from Phyllis. Let's remember that. Anybody else with an unspoken request? Yes, the Lord knows our need today. We've got a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Because God is good and how he has blessed us today. Well, let's, uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Let's pray for these. And the Lord knows every need that's listed on here and even those that are not listed on here. God knows every need. Our Father which art in heaven, O Lord, and before thy throne of grace we do find ourselves again. Father, we come. Lord, here knowing that, Father, you have promised to meet us here every time. And you told us and you invited us, God, to come boldly into the throne of grace that we might find help. And Father, if there's ever a time that we need help, it's the day in which we live. And so, Father, we ask you, Lord, for that help. We ask you, God, for wisdom to guide us through a time that we are, are very uh, unfamiliar with, a time that we're uncertain about. But, Father, we are reminded in the Scriptures that you have never left us, no, you'll never leave us, nor forsake us. So, Father, may we look in, at these uncertain times through the, through the telescope of the scriptures. And it will quickly remind us that you're still on our side, that you still have a plan for your children. And Father, you have promised to give us a, a, a safe landing on heaven's bright shore. Father, give us the wisdom to, to face the enemy. But most of all, dear God, give us the boldness or that we find in people like Peter and Paul. Now, Father, as they stood by against the adversary all the time. When they told him they couldn't uh, preach Jesus, they said we ought to obey God rather than man. So Father, help us today. Lord, we cannot stand in our own strength, but Father, we can stand in yours. And Father, I pray you forgive us, Lord, for our weakness. Uh, God, forgive us for our failure, uh, Lord, and for our doubts and fears that we often find ourselves in. 
And Father, I pray for people today that's having to go through this time that doesn't know Christ. I pray for these that are lost, God, need to be saved. I pray, Father, maybe through this time of turmoil, they'll realize there's an ark of safety in Christ Jesus. May we be an example to them that we have peace in the time of trouble. May they see us worshiping our God. May they see us praising our God even in a time when praise is hard to come by. I just pray, God, you give that to us today. And Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray for our president. I pray, Father, you'll give him the wisdom and strength, Father, to do the right thing. And I pray for this evilness, God, that's around him. I pray, Father, you'll help him, Lord, to be strong and we'll put an armor around him. We'll protect him and our governor and all, all those folks and people that are trying to make right decisions. And Lord, I pray for the people, the pastors and the local churches, God, that are trying to make right decisions. Lord, we know we face the same enemy. And Father, we just, but, but like I said before, we know who's on our side. And Father, we just ask for your help. Father, I pray for our people today that are suffering sickness. Oh, Lord, I pray for Jim Baker in the hospital and Marvin Thompson. Today, you'll be with him. Pray for Chad as he gets ready for surgery. Things go well for him. And Father, we thank you for these praise reports we heard this morning. For those, Father, you've helped and given good reports to. Father, we don't want to be the one that doesn't come back. We want to be the one that says, thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer. Thank you, God, for giving us a uh, time, Father, to the throne of grace. And Lord, you've helped us. And Father, we ask you, Lord, to bless those on our health needs list. There's many of them. We don't know exactly what the problem is. But dear God, you know everything. And so, Father, we ask you to help them, heal them. And we pray for these that are on our list that are lost. We pray for you'll, you'll save them. We thank you for these young people that's been saved in this meeting we've had, this Arise Conference. Lord, I pray for these young hearts, Lord, this, if ever there is a day that the devil is, is after young people, it's the day. And God, I pray you'll build a hedge around these young people. As they're hearing the gospel preach, and Lord, an encouragement has been coming. Oh, Father, we just pray for them today. And Lord, we ask you to bless our military people, and we ask you, God, to bless our missionaries, help them today. Our folks getting ready for surgery, we think of Shelby. She'll be with her and help her. And Pastor Larry Dyer, you'll be with him. We continue to pray for Sue and Michelle as they're recovering today. Our people, Father, that cannot be here for whatever reason, we pray for them. Lord, those that are listening by the way of live stream, we ask a blessing in their home uh, today as well. Father, bless the word of God. We thank you for the word of God. Lord, it leads us and it guides us and it helps us. It gives us strength. It, it brings a smile to our face. It gives encouragement to our hearts. Father, bless us, help us today as we get in the Word of God again. And Lord, give us something from it that we might take out to a lost world that's in need of a Savior. They'll see the light of Christ shine from us. Lord, as we'll talk about the, 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 the light of Christ today, as we'll talk about the glow, Lord, that should be in every one of us because now that presence of God lives within us. Father, help us today. We love you and we thank you. Lead us where it's pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, in your Bible this morning, Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter number 34. We finished up last week. Of course, when we finished up last week, Moses, has, uh, uh, Moses had beheld God's glory, if you remember. God had hit him in the cleft of the rock, and Moses had asked God to show me thy glory. Of course, God told him, no man can have seen God and lived. But God gave Moses the privilege to see his glory up close and personal. And you, you, know, you know, we read it, we studied it last week, how he hit him in the cleft of the rock and cuffed his hand over him uh, and lifted it just enough for him to see enough to know he had been in the presence of God. Amen. Now, Old Testament times, the glory of God didn't indwell people. It indwell the tabernacle. And that's where Moses would frequently go, you know, into his tabernacle. Later on, the tabernacle will be built. And in the holies of holies, this kind of glory of God will reside in the temple. The glory of God would reside. 
Now, Christ changed all that. We'll talk about that some today. Paul talks a little bit about that. You know, now the, the presence of God indwells every believer. Amen. You see. And so we, we should radiate that glory. Uh, and that, that glory should never fade away. Amen. Now, today we're going to begin in, in, in Exodus chapter number 34. And if you remember, the children of Israel has failed. Uh, they fell into idolatry. And while Moses was on the mount, uh, they became impatient waiting on Moses. And so they called for Aaron. Aaron would mold them a, a calf and then that, and announced that this is now your God. And you are to give glory to this, your God. Of course, that upset the Lord. And we've, we've been through all this. And of course, Moses intercedes on behalf of the people. And, uh, and God's presence now, of course, God had gotten angry and had lifted his presence from them and uh, uh, said, I will send my angel, you remember? And uh, of course, God had a right to be angry. For they were given all his glory that he had done for them to an idol, you see. And they'd forgotten what God had done for them. Much like a world we live in today. Amen. They've forgotten what God's done for them. They've forgotten what was founded on. Amen. Uh, and they're trying to tear down everything that reminds this nation of what we were founded on. Amen. And people that fought battles and people that died for, 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 for us to have what we have. But nonetheless, Moses now is called to the mount. He goes back up on the mount to intercede. For the people, now let's begin in chapter 34, and uh, we'll probably get this entire chapter today, because uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a good, wonderful chapter, and uh, uh, we're going to just breeze right through it. But in, ver in verse number one, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto, unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. Now let me ask you a question, what happened to the first set of stones? He broke them, remember, in anger. When he saw the people worshiping the idol, Moses cast the stones. You see, they, they had done broken God's commands. So he, th he, he, he threw them and broke them. Now notice the difference here <clears throat> as we look at this. The Lord is not, the first set of stones, the Lord cut out himself. Amen. But now this set, what has to happen? Moses, you have to cut them out. You go hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first that I gave you. Uh, and and as, I, as I read this, I thought that, you know, uh, our anger sometimes has consequences. Now Moses had a right to be angry. But did he have a right to be so angry that he broke, the, that he threw the commands of God? And by the way, have you ever been that angry? What's all you have? We're human, ain't we? And there's things that angers us, makes us mad. But now he's got to hew his own set of stones. And he says in the latter part of that verse, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. Now Moses, you go hew these stones. And by the way, uh, it probably wasn't a very easy job. He's going to have to go cut these out. And he didn't have stuff like we have today. And uh, so he's going to have to cut these stones out. He's going to have to make them just like the other the stones that he had. And then when that is complete, God will then rewrite what he write. And by the way, that was with the finger of God, by the way, if you remember. And uh, so he's going to rewrite them. Verse number two. And now I like this statement. And be ready in the morning. He don't have much time to do this, does he? And you be ready in the morning. He didn't say, when you get them stones ready, I will come to you. You be ready in the morning. Amen. That's just like the coming of the Lord. He told us to be ready. He didn't tell us to try to figure out when it was. Amen. He didn't say, I'll come on this certain date, you be ready on this date. He's, we should always be ready. Moses, you be ready in the morning. And come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. Now, 
If I'm reading the scripture right, Moses already went into the mount. Remember, he went back a second time to make intercession for the children of Israel. And so God's calling him up even further into the mount. Matter of fact, he's calling him all the way where? To the top of the mount. Now, verse number uh, three. No man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Come by yourself, Moses. Neither let the flocks nor the herds feed before the mount. Now God still has anger against his people. And Moses, you come by yourself. They're not even to hang around the mount. You come by yourself. And so the Bible tells us in verse number four, and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tables of stone. Moses obeyed God. Moses followed God's instruction. By the way, that's the only way, it's the only way you'll come out ahead is to obey God's commands and to obey what God has said. Uh, even today, we that are under grace, we still should obey God. Our grace doesn't give us a license to live like the devil. Amen. You see, we still need to be in obedience unto God. We still need to know what God has said. We still need to make plans to be obedient to the word of God. Verse 5, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, God has met Moses right where he told him he'd meet him. Amen. And now he meets Moses and begins to proclaim uh, the name of the Lord. Now, verse number 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God. Now notice, he's going to now begin to announce the attributes of God. And by the way, we are to understand these attributes. This, these are the attributes of, of our God today. And he says, and the Lord passed by uh, before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful. Number one, he is a merciful God. Amen. He operates in mercy. Uh, he's merciful and what? Gracious. And by the way, God must be very gracious when we look at the condition that the world's in today. And he must be very merciful when we see even the mockery that's going on against God today. You think of the mockery of the children of Israel. Just in what we've studied in Exodus, how they were making a mockery out of God and, and worshiping idol gods, and, and, and God became angry with them. And by the way, uh, I think today God becomes angry with us. He becomes angry with the things that our world is doing. You know, the lost man knows no different, but the saved man should know different. Amen. But many of them are living uh, against God. And so uh, we see God merciful and gracious. And here's another one, long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but what? All should come to repentance. You see, God is so loving and so merciful and so gracious that he's extended uh, an opportunity for every person to be saved. Amen. Even the worst of sinners God has grace and God has mercy, you see. It goes on to say, and he's abundant in goodness and truth. Now verse seven, look here, keeping mercy for thousands. Here, 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 here we see a forgiving God. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that, now I want you to know, but notice something else that God also does. And that will by no means clear the guilty. 
In other words, uh, there's consequences for sin. God's not going to say, well, you know. I, well, now, by the way, I believe I, God forgives us of our sins and God forgives us of our transgressions, but with our sin and with our choices comes consequences. We talked about that some not long ago, you see. There's consequences for our sin. And I believe a lot of people live in their consequences. Amen. I could take you to people right now. They could tell you they, they know they're saved, they know they're going to heaven, but their life is in the shape it's in because of the choices they made. And by the way, that might never go away as long as you're here. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. You think of David. He lived in the consequence of his sin. He lived that all his life, didn't he? You see. And that's why it's so important. And I tell young people all the time, and I tell my children all the time, before you say yes, consider what the consequence may be. Are you ready and willing to live your entire life in that consequence? Because it comes. He will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Sometimes the sin of one man carries through generations of families. Amen. You believe that? They are plagued through generations to come. That's why it's so important that we consider what we're doing and, and consult the scriptures about what they say about it, what the scriptures say about it, you see. And if it's not in his book, or if this book condemns it, it probably don't, it just don't have anything to do with it. Amen? That's the best philosophy. It's, uh, it's not a popular philosophy, by the way, uh, but it's the best. Now, verse number eight. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth. What did he do? Worshiped. You see, Moses once again has entered into the presence of God. And he said, now he's speaking to God, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. Lord, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon, now notice the wording. Notice what he says. Pardon what? Our iniquity and our sin. And take us for thine inheritance. You know what Moses just did? He put himself in the same category as them people. Because you know what Moses was? He was a sinner. Amen. Uh, he, he's just prone to sin as they were. And can, you, can I tell you today, and I think all of us are saved and ready to go to heaven, we're still sinners. We're, we're saved by God's grace and we're on God's honor roll. Amen. And God loves us and helps us, but we're still sinners. Let me tell you something. Don't ever think that you're so saved you can't sin. Amen. Because temptation is everywhere. And Satan is a, as good at what he does. I met a woman one time. I may have told you this story. I met a woman one time. We got in a conversation about being saved. And she said, well, preacher, I tell you, I know I'm saved. I'm so saved that I haven't sinned since I've been saved. And I said, well, hmm. I said, how do how you do that? She said, ain't you done it? I said, no, I ain't that good. Well, are you going to go to heaven? I said, well, sure. I said, it ain't based on my goodness. Yes, it is. I said, no, it ain't. And it ain't based on yours either. Amen. You see, when you think you are saved to perfection, you're probably lost. Amen. Because we are sinners. We're still sinners. But, but when, when temptation comes and when sin comes, our God is gracious to forgive us and to help us. Yes, God will help us in those temptations if we'll let him. Amen. And so Moses puts himself there with the people. We need your help, God. We need your guidance. Verse 10. 
And he said, Behold, the Lord speaking, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing. Now understand this word terrible means awesome. It is a terrible or awesome thing that I will do with thee. Now, can I tell you something? God is renewing a covenant. He's already made a covenant with them. Amen? They broke it. I think it's, I'm, I'm guessing, let's go back to Exodus 19. Um, I'm thinking it's here. I should have wrote it down, but I didn't. And where God makes the first covenant and the people makes a promise uh, to follow him and uh, I'm not sure where it's at, but I think it's in this chapter. But anyway, um, we see the first commandment. By the way, they broke that commandment, didn't they? They had promised to follow God, and they had promised to do what God had told them, and uh, uh, and so they uh, five, through eight. Uh, five through eight. Let's look at it now. Therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. God's covenant with them to go and be their God and to go with them and, and they would obey him. And of course, they, they put their stamp of agreement on it, didn't they? We will obey him. We will obey your commands. Well, it didn't take long for them to forget what they had said and thus the covenant became broken, you see. But God now is going to renew the covenant here with them. Because of who? One man. Because of Moses. Moses making intercession for them. Moses begging God on their behalf. Moses is coming into God's presence saying, Lord, we cannot do it without you. We're sinners. I'm a sinner. And what are we going to do if you don't help us? How are we going to manage? And, and by the way, that should be our same prayer today. God, we can't navigate this mess by ourselves. Amen. Lord have mercy. You leave it in the man's hands. He's already made a mess out of it. Amen. We need God's help. And we need people interceding to God on behalf of crazy people. Amen. Yeah. On behalf of people doing crazy stuff. You see, we still have the power to reach a holy God. Okay. Now, verse 11 Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before, and I see he's back. He's back. I'm going to drive them out. Before, remember what he said? What did he say before? I will send my angel to drive them out. Remember? Now, look what he says. Observe that thou, thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Pezzarite and the Havite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be, a, a, be for a snare in the midst of thee. He said, now Moses, I'm going to drive them out. You're not to mix, mix, mix and mingle with them. You're not to have anything to do with them. You're not to eat at the table with them. You're not to discuss sacrifice with them. You're not to marry into them. Uh, you're not, I'm going to run them out. You're to stay away from them. Why would God tell him that? Because they would turn them away from him. Because they would convince them. And we've seen how easily they were convinced not too long ago. Amen. They would convince them that their gods is better than their God. You see. And by the way, 
I wonder today in our world, we're seeing a vast attack on the church. Oh, you see it, it's here. And they're doing it, they're not raising any guns, not raising any weaponry, they're doing it through a thing called fear. Amen? Come on now, stay with me. We're seeing it, and now the churches are suffering, and the churches are scratching their heads and wondering what to do, when we've been told what to do. Amen? You see, and so... uh, Fear is a big thing. Persuasion is a big thing. Don't ever think Satan can't persuade you. Because he can. And he will. He knows the tricks of the trade. He knows what it takes. That's why God is saying, I'm going to drive them out of the land because God knew if you get in there and mix and mingle with them idolaters, next thing you know, you're going to be worshiping their God and once again, you forgot Jehovah God. Amen. Amen. And if we start mixing and mingling in the world, the next thing you know, we're listening to the world's music and not God's music. We're reading the world's Bible and not God's Bible. Come on now. Help me. We're soon mixed in with the world. God said, I'm going to drive them out. Don't mix in with them. Now, they don't listen to him. They don't listen. By the way, when you you talk of trickery, turn, turn over with me to the book of Joshua, just a moment, chapter number nine. I'm telling you, that the devil knows how to trick you, doesn't he? Now, I mean, let's read a few verses here. We probably should read the entire chapter, but, but uh, that's a long way to go there. And, uh, but let's, let's just read a few verses. We're going to see here the trickery. By the way, they did not do what God told them to do. They did not drive out all the end. Matter of fact, in the next few verses in our text, he tells them, you're going to, you're to break down their altars, you're to destroy their idol gods, you're to get rid of that stuff, get it out of your presence, don't have anything to do with it. Now, in Joshua chapter number 9, it says, And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and all the coast of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite, you heard these names before? And the Pezzarite and the Habite and the Jebusite heard thereof. Isn't that just the ones that he mentioned? That they gather themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. Now notice something. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and Ai, you know what he had done. You know what he had done to Jericho. I mean, they, they wiped him out, you see. And Ai... And they worked willingly and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clawed upon their feet and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua and to the camp at Gilgal and said unto him, And to the men of Israel, we be come from a far country. They just come next door. But uh, we have come from a far country. Now therefore make ye league with us. We're poor, we're tired, we're hungry. (laughs) Isn't that what they're doing? You know what it is? It's trickery. It's trickery. And the men of Israel said unto unto the Havites, Perventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a far, very far country, thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. Now, you could go on and read the rest of this chapter. Basically, they're, they're going to get themselves in there. And they're going to mix and mingle with the children of Israel. Through what? Trickery. Right. You see what? Exactly. You're hitting it right on the money. Satan is all about trickery. Amen. And if I can... By by the way, he's not worried about truth. There was no truth in Joshua chapter 9. They were lying. What does the Bible say about Satan? He is a liar and the father of it. You see, so he's all about trickery and he's all about fooling people and he's not worried about truth. He's, he's not of truth, you see. 
But if I can get into their assembly, then I can rip that assembly apart. Amen? And by the way, he's good at what he does. You see, and God is telling Moses, uh, I'm going to run them out. But now let's, let's go back to our text here and, uh, and verse number 13. But ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their grooves. Get rid of them things. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. You see. The commands of God. Verse 15. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifices. Otherwise, Moses, if you don't, next thing you know, you're going to be eating with them. Amen. Next thing you know, you know you're going to be worshiping with them. Next thing you know, you're going to be doing just exactly what they're doing. Can I tell you what? Can I say this? And I, I say it kindly, and I don't mention any names, but many of the churches are doing exactly what the world wants them to do. Amen. And they've got the world all over them, you see. And that's why they're so popular. Amen. All right, let's move on. Um, Verse 16, and thou shalt take of their daughters, and thou shalt take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go hoarding after their gods, and make thy sons go hoarding. In other words, if you mix and mingle with them, Moses, next thing you know, your sons are going to be marrying their daughters, your daughters are going to be marrying their sons. And the next thing you know, they're going to be winning them over to an idol god. Amen. And then you'll be back in the same mess you're in. Verse 17, thou shalt make thee no molten gods, which they've already done. Verse 18, the feast of unleavened bread thou shalt keep. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, as I commanded thee in the time of the month of Bib. For in the month of Bib thou camest out of Egypt. You are to keep the, the commands of God. You are to keep the Passovers of God. You are, this is what you need to instruct your people in, Moses. Amen. To worship God according to God's standards, not according to man's standards. Verse 19, all that open in the matrix is mine, and every firstling among thy cattle, where, whether ox or sheep, that is male, belongs to me. The first belongs to me. You know, you go back into Egypt, one of the plagues was death of the firstborn, wasn't it? And God spared the firstborn of the Egyptians, those who had the what? Blood on the doorpost. You see, this Passover was to be a reminder of the time God delivered them from that bondage. God delivered them from that bitterness they were in. And now part of their sacrifice is the the, the best, the first of of uh, of the males, of the cattle, and of the sheep was to be given to God. But notice this. But the firstling of an ass. By the way, an ass is a beast of burden. It's not a pure animal as the sheep. It, matter of fact, it was considered an unclean animal. Amen. It, 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 it was to die, basically. Notice what he says. But the firstling of an ass, thou shalt redeem with a what? Lamb. If you're going to save the ass, the beast of the burden, that dirty animal, then you're going to have to sacrifice a lamb, the pure, spotless lamb. And that lamb's death will save the ass's life. Uh, Can I tell you where we were? We were as that ass. That donkey. Dirty, unclean, unfit, deserved to die. But there was a lamb. There was a lamb slain for us. That lamb was Christ Jesus. Because of that, we've been redeemed by that lamb. Amen? 
And so he's telling him here, but the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. So God's requirements. Verse 21, six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. That's the Sabbath day. In, in erring time and in harvest time shalt thou rest, no matter when it is. This is the day of the Lord. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks and of the first fruits of the wheat and harvest and the feast of ingatherings at year's end. He's commanded Moses that when you bring these people out and we run out the enemy, they're to worship God. Amen. You are to lead them in worship. You are to lead them in what I've given you. And we went over all this, what God gave him and told him how this to be done and when it was to be done. And now you are to lead them out and you will lead them into this proper worship away from the idol gods and you will lead them into the commands that God has given you, that I have given you. And it's to lead them in worship. Today... You and I are to come into the worship of God apart from the world. Amen. Apart from the world, we have been commanded to worship God. We have commanded how to worship God. And we are to come apart from the world. Matter of fact, we ought to run the world out. Amen. And we ought to run the world out of our lives and out of our homes and out of our churches and let us worship God. You know, uh, one of the reasons I believe that we don't see revival today is because we got too much other stuff going on. Matter of fact, Sunday school, Sunday morning, I'm going to give you the prerequisites to revival uh, in Nehemiah chapter number one when Nehemiah would see revival. But you know where it started? In Nehemiah being where he is supposed to be. Amen. Where was he? He was the king's cupbearer. You know what he was doing in the king's palace? He was doing his job. Just like God put him to do his job. Amen. And he was doing it rightly. He was doing the right thing. He wasn't mixed and mingling somewhere else. And God used him. You see. And by the way, God's got a place for us, doesn't he? And that's where we're supposed to be. Okay. Verse 23, thrice in the year shall all your men, children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. As in three of those feasts, the men, the males, were to appear before God. For I will cast out the nations before thee, and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land, when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. Now, verse 25. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of... Passover be left unto the morning. These are the instructions God's already given to them. You see, he's telling Moses, this is what you're to do with the people. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. And the Lord said unto Moses, write these words, for after the tenure of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. God has renewed his covenant, you see, with them because of Moses, you see. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, of the Ten Commandments. Now, in the remainder of this chapter, we're going to see this glow of Moses. Moses has been in the presence of God. Of course, this ain't the first time he's been in the presence of God. But notice here what has happened. You know, we, Moses has spent now how many days now on the mount total? He has spent 80 days. Remember, it was 40 days first, and he came off, and he was worshiping that calf. And then he went another 40 days in the mount. So he's been in God's presence now uh, for 80 days, uh, talking to God and, and getting instructions from God. All this time. Now, verse 29, it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in his hand, Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not 
that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He's glowing, isn't he? And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. No doubt he's telling them what God has told them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. He's telling them, here's what God has said. By the way, when your preacher preaches, he's telling you what God has said. If he's in this word. Amen. And afterward, let's see, where where did I leave off? 33. And until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took off the veil until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. Notice Moses frequently when in the presence of God. And by the way, the presence of God in the Old Testament dwelt in that tabernacle. It didn't dwell in the hearts of people. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. I, I studied a little bit on this veil. And I began to wonder, and I've, and I've done some research. You get different answers now when you do research and commentaries. But why did Moses put the veil over his face is, the, is a question that I pondered a while. And most folks would say it's because the children of Israel, uh, so, they, so you know, they, they were blinded by it, presumably. And, of course, uh, I don't think that's why he put the veil on his face. I think Paul answers the question why Moses put the bell on his face in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Moses did not want the children of Israel to see the glory of God fading. Because, can I tell you, the Old Testament glory of God had to fade. Amen? Because now, with Christ, when Christ came and died on the cross, now the holy presence of God doesn't dwell in tabernacles. Where does it dwell? In the hearts of men. And that glory should always shine. Right? Because he always shines. The glory of God in the Old Testament is going to fade out. It's going to fade into a new way. That way is Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, and Moses put the veil on his face so they wouldn't see the glory fading. And when Moses would go into the tabernacle and meet with God, that glow would come back, but he'd have to put the veil on his face because it wouldn't take long until that glory began to fade. And he didn't want them to see the fading of that glory. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll finish up here today. Second Corinthians chapter number three, and uh, let's let's begin down about verse uh, ten. Bible says, "For even that which was made glorious uh, had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For that which is done away was glorious." much more than that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such a hope, we use great plainness of speech. Now notice what he says in verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. You see, that old... T- and by the way, Moses, uh, uh, Paul spends... The book of Hebrews, trying to tell the Hebrews that Christ is the new way. Get out of the Old Testament law. Get into Christ. And verse 14, but their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. Nevertheless, 
When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Many of the Jews today still have the veil, don't they? And they, they, have not, they, have not, that they have not come to realize that that glory of that Old Testament way has faded away. And the new way is in Christ Jesus. Now there'll come a day when the true Jew, that veil will be lifted, you see. But until then, they're still blinded, you see, by the Old Testament way, you see. Moses would put that veil on, so at that time, and I believe this, and I could be wrong, but I believe this, that he put that veil on so they would not see. Now, there's a question, I think me and Pastor Mays were discussing it. Did Moses have that glow the rest of his life? I don't know that I can answer that, but I'm going to say he probably did. Because frequently he would visit in that, the presence of God. You go study how many times Moses would go into the presence of God on behalf of the people. You see. I believe Moses had access to the holies of holies and the high priest. And uh, uh, because Moses was the man of God. Amen. Amen. And he had that glow of God upon him. Now, there's a lot of things we don't know, but, but uh, I just, uh, when I was studying that, and I was reading that, and, and I think that's what Paul is trying to tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Well, that brings us to chapter 35. And we will, uh, we'll do chapter 35, and, um, and we're probably going to go over to chapter 40 before we completely finish uh, the book of uh, Exodus. And uh, we're not going to go back through all these chapters of the building of the tabernacle. What you have, he had the instructions in the early part of, of uh, well, in a few verses back, he had the instructions of building. In verse 36, uh, you have then the actual building of the tabernacle. And it's the same wording, pretty much, uh, as you find in there. So we're not going to go over all that. Uh, but we will jump to chapter 40 and talk about the assembling of the tabernacle as we finish up and the glory of the Lord that will set down in it uh, at the close of the book of Exodus. Okay? All righty. Well, let's stand to be dismissed today. Almighty God, it's been good to be in the house of God again in your holy presence. Thank you, God, for the study of your word. Lord, how rich and powerful it is. And Lord, I just pray we'll take this and use this and Father, we'll always be found giving glory to God. Lord, we don't want to give no honor to this world. And Father, we don't want the world to block out your glory. Help us, God, to do what is right and be right and faithful according to the word of God. Lord, we want your, you to shine to a lost and dying world. When the world's trying to close you up, we want to open you up that folks might see you. Father, forgive us for our sin and help us, Lord, in our decision making. Protect us, Lord, these as they go from this place. Build a hedge around them. Protect them, Father, from these elements and this old virus. Our Lord, bring us back next point in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you want Wondrous revelation Whosoever